so thank you very much. I don't know where, it, it is true, I had the privilege to meet uh, Dr. Rosalind Yalo when I was very young and deciding whether to go straight PhD or, or MD. And um, almost as fast as I can tell the story, she advised me to get a medical degree because it would be much more straightforward to get uh, to get grants, she said. Okay, so I was I was really <laughs> headed completely the other direction, um, and uh, I, th that was kind of one of the coolest things. At the time, she was at the only living woman to have received a Nobel Prize in science, uh, which isn't relevant for this talk. Relevant because she figured out how to measure small things like. Um, thyroid function and she using radio immunoassay, that's why she got a Nobel Prize. Okay, sorry for that. Um, <laughs> I, I, really, uh, I really am very pleased to be here and, and thank you, Elizabeth, for inviting me. Um, I am gonna talk today about uh, new and old corticosteroid news and I'm taking this talk from the point of view of, um, if the slide goes forward, which it might not, if I'm pointing <laughs> in the wrong direction. Um, Sorry. So if you have a... Oh, do I have the, the wrong one? I have yeah. the Mac one. You have the Mac, that's the And Mac he one. taught me that. I'm yeah. so sorry. Thank you. Yes, this is going to work a lot better now. I, I have disclosures, but none of them are relevant to this talk, and I've received funding for most of this work through the MDA. Well, maybe not. Okay. So this is a quick introduction, and all of you know this, but... But uh, Duchenne is very progressive, and I put the, out this uh, slide from a two-year-old that we biopsied way back in the day when you did biopsy to make a diagnosis. So if you look by biopsy at age two, the muscle doesn't look too bad. For those in the audience who are paying attention, they'll notice a regenerating fiber that shouldn't be there, and maybe a slight bit of increased connective tissue. And if you look at an MRI, which is a study we did years ago, that doesn't look too bad either. Um, and ultrasound, you can still see nice, nice definition. But as time goes on, as we all know, this story does not uh, stay the same. And um, fibrous tissue increases by age 10. There's a lot of fibrosis. You can look at it by MRI. You can look at it by ultrasound where this beautiful bone window here completely disappears. So we know that uh, in the world of SMA, people talk about you know time is motor neurons. Well, in the world of mus muscle, time is muscle. And I think it's important to remember that, which is why um, I wanna talk to you about what we've been doing with steroids for about the last uh, 17, 18 years. We're gonna hear a lot about why we might not love steroids. Um, there's so many things that we encounter, weight gain, cushionoid features, you'll hear and know about all of them by the end of the talk. But um, I actually grew up uh, I, 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 in an era where we already knew that corticosteroids uh, worked. And the CIDD group, Mike Brooks, who just died recently, was one of the major players, and he was at Washington University. So a pilot study done by Dan Drachman, where um, I'm told uh, by, that he thought it certainly won't work, so he was going to prove it didn't work, so people stopped giving boys with Duchenne steroids, and then he proved it did work. And then the, the really elegant studies, the randomized trials in um, Duchenne, uh, really defined the time course uh, of when steroids worked, how they worked, and even in, in really an ideal dose, which at the time was 0 0.75 milligrams per kilo. And I point out that in this, 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 these studies, which came out in 1990, 1991, which just when I was becoming, um, uh, pra I was practicing. In the United States, they have a long adolescence, so I had been out of medical school six or seven years, and then, uh, only then, I was allowed to take care of uh, children on my own. And still not smart enough, I'm a slow learner here. So when I, when I grew up with that, for the first seven, eight years I practiced, I was very um, inspired by this and I knew that corticosteroids would work and I was extremely committed and I talked virtually every single patient I encountered um, uh, into taking corticosteroids 
uh, to trying corticosteroids, and they would try 0 0.7 mil milligrams per kilo, as we all know, and we all know, and I saw it, they developed obesity, linear growth arrest, slowing or arrest, and more than 50% in my committed hands would say, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna do this. Uh, the child would say it, the parents would support it, the child was not happy, the side effects were too much. So it was really in that context that I did a pilot study funded by, well, no one, um, but it was uh, approved, um, and it was 20 consecutive boys, and I, I, I really want to point out that these were 20 boys in a row for whom it was time to start on corticosteroids. Some of them had been, we'd been following, and the standard of care then was that, you know, if they started hinting about falling around seven or eight, you probably ought to think about steroids. That was the standard of care, and that's what the CIDD group showed. So I started um, with an idea that maybe that a dose that they could actually stay on might work better if I could get them to stay on it. And this was the 10 milligrams per kilo per week divided into two doses. And this is the pilot study results, and I'm going to torment you with two sets of, uh, two slides on this, only two slides on this paper. The twice weekly was effective. The average age was eight, which we all know is a kind of a late age. But the p-values, um, looking at historical controls, was um, 0 0.001 for upper limb, uh, upper extremity. That's grip, that, that's biceps and triceps together and uh, 0 0.002 for grip strength, that's just squeeze the grip meter, and less than that for lower extremity, though only 17 of the 20 had anti-gravity quadriceps strength, so only 17 of the 20. But the cool thing for me was that obesity rates were the same as the untreated control, exactly the same. Cushionoid features absolutely did not develop, and 16, because the paper kept coming back to me for a few more ideas and could you refix this? Every time it came back for a revision, I would add more time. So ultimately, I had 16 that were treated greater than one year, and 15 of those 16 remained stronger than at baseline. This is the lower extremity data of the individual patients, and again, 20 in a row. No, no, nobody didn't say yes. Everybody said yes. Um, and I told them that the plan was that if I did not see or hear a response within three months, one to three months, they had a phone call at one month, are you doing better? Everybody knows about that phone call because it's a happy phone call. They're all doing better generally at one month. But if they weren't doing better, the plan was to switch them to what had been recommended, which was the uh, daily steroids. So these are the 20 boys, and, and they go from youngest to oldest. So this, this boy who was already starting to fall, sorry, the the first boy, I'll just say it, the first boy was started pretty young, and that's his course in six-month uh, increments. The arrow indicates when they were started, and so, for example, patient number three had a clear decline in his uh, lower extremity strength, and, and he um, was then started at the point of the arrow, and up he went, and so you can see that pretty much every child um, six is a great example, um, really were in the decline phase, either historically as in case number one, but in virtually every other child by exam, they were in a decline phase and they showed improvement. So the, the, along the way, and I, I, you can't kind of make this up, I, I wasn't able to get funding for that, but based on the excellent <laughs> preliminary data in people, I was able to treat the mice, and that is the way it happened. So this is in 2007, I did get a grant to look at, uh, look at the MDX mouse. And the MDX mouse, um, really, um, people didn't think it was very useful because they, they get kind of strong uh, early on. But if you actually measure them and compare them to their mouse peers, they are weak all along and stay weak. And so this uh, on the bottom is age in weeks, and it goes up to 84 weeks. And you'll see that the top is what's supposed to happen to healthy mice, and then the second line is on twice weekly oral cortico uh, corticosteroids. 
And the, the twice weekly, in that case, it turns out that mice just kind of lap it up. You don't have to gavage it. They don't have taste buds, and they kind of like prednisone in all of its forms. And, and they do not have the ability to throw up. So they're, And they're really compliant. They show up at every single visit. It's uh, remarkable. So we were able to show that, yes, uh, there is a benefit lifelong. And on the right, on the right you'll see the survival analysis, which was um, positive. And uh, so there was a survival benefit, there was a strength benefit. And then with, with, the, with those pieces of data, we were able to get funding from the MDA through the Synergy Network. This is a 12-site randomized 64-boy um, study. They were ages 4 to 10, and they were randomized in a blinded fashion. It wasn't deemed ethical to have a placebo arm when you have a treatable drug. So everybody got drug, but everybody, all the boys, took a pill every single day. But for some of them, that pill on the weekend was, um, uh, through the week, was placebo, and on the weekend, it was, it was the actual drug. A couple of remarkable things. This is a long paper, but I just want to point out a couple of fun facts about it. It, they were equally efficacious in this one-year study. Uh, you'll see another one-year study in a minute, but this was a one-year study. Um, it was, they were equally efficacious for quantitative muscle strength testing, manual muscle testing, which is the way the, um, the studies had been done in the past, and actually time functional testing. They, 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 one interesting thing is that force vital capacity, in, this is a young age group, so actually improved a little bit in, um, in the weekend dose and, um, and a little bit in the daily dose. So force vital capacity improved. But behavior, as measured in its detailed analysis uh, where the parents had to take, uh, take, answer extensive questionnaire, they actually improved in both groups. So um, DEXA, however, was interesting to me in that lumbar bone density improved in the weekend dose, and of course, as expected, it decreased in the daily dose. So the CDC had a really strong statement in 2010, and some people were in this room were involved with that, and I was, uh, you know, one of the et alls somewhere down in the bottom, so I helped with this, uh, and they, 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 in the United States, um, on average, you'll see about 50% of people were even treating st with steroids, and they were having the same lack of success. If they tried, the children came off. But the, the strong statement said, okay, this will slow the decline. It will reduce your risk of scoliosis. It'll stabilize your pulmonary function. It improves cardiac outcome. And in 2013, this paper on the bottom, uh, this paper on the right came out, which showed that you know all-cause survival and all-cause cardiomyopathy were improved if you were on steroids versus not. And I do like to, if it works nicely, which it might not. One slide. Yeah. Oh, there's my survival curve for the mice. So just wanted to uh, throw that back in there that that it helps the mice and it helps the boys. So our standard of care at WashU has been twice weekly for, for about 17, 18 years. Um, these are two, two uh, little lads who are only one year apart. Um, the guy on the right is 13, and the guy on the left is 12. And the guy on the, on the left has been on um, twice weekly corticosteroids, and the one on the right has been on deflazacor at 0 0.9 uh, milligrams per kilo per day. In the CDC guidelines from 2010, they allowed uh, twice weekly, and they, uh, um, they, if it wasn't, if daily wasn't, the recommendation was daily, but if it wasn't tolerated, you could try this, this regimen, or you could try every other day, or you could try the first 10 days of the month. And the, the standard of care, which I'm not going to go into except for this one slide, is that twice weekly and 10 days on and off are, are not anywhere in the chart. The guidelines, and this is, the, in my opinion, the only weakness is the guidelines for when and how you implement corticosteroids are not specific. It says to discuss them, that's certainly important, and to begin, quote unquote, before physical decline. But anybody who's taking care of Duchenne boys knows that decline can be a child who's two and a half not walking, or decline can be an 11 or 12 year old 
who is just starting to have trouble walking uh, if they have a, you know, a fortunate mutation. So that, that, that's there. This is just one quick example to remind me to say the next slide. The next slide says uh, corticosteroids are not a cure. This slide indicates one child's course with twice weekly. It's actually the lad on the left that you saw. He, his parents um, had said between the ages of three and three and a half, he was definitely not doing as much. They said it. Um, he is is and was and is brilliant, and he was very cooperative. And his strength testing, which at this age I usually expect to go up, was not going up, neither in his upper extremities or in his lower extremities. The biceps is on the bottom for strength in pounds, and the top is quadriceps. Um, so we started corticosteroids at that point, and he had a very nice um, a progressive increase in strength until about the age of eight. And then he started to go down a little bit, but I expected that. I did not expect what happened to him between nine and a half and 10. So at age 10, we had a little discussion. I'm like, gosh, that's a fairly big drop. What's going on here? And um, it turned out that the, the little pills on the weekend were ending up in his pillow case, and his mother would occasionally find them. And we had a heart to heart, and he promised he would take them again. And actually, all of these are done blinded, by the way. I don't. And I didn't know he was off, and I didn't look at these before. So every visit is done blinded because of spectacular help from fellows. I don't have to look before I measure. But anyway, he had a very nice response. And, and fortunately, at age 11, he qualified for, uh, for a trial of exon skipping. But it does have long-term um, benefits. And... Uh, again, in 2010, who's treating? Um, who's staying on, on treatment? Um, how about after ambulation is lost? Those were the big questions I was interested in. And um, we were able to collaborate with uh, five other sites in the United States with an MDA-funded project to look at, the, at outcomes. We were trying to be trial ready in outcomes for non-ambulatory boys and men. That's why the study was done. But to my surprise, um, for these very experienced sites, uh, 91 boys were entered, 47 non-ambulatory boys were not on corticosteroids, so 50%. Um, and 25 were on daily steroids, which I expected, and 19 were on twice weekly. We first did reliability outcomes, which were, gosh, which were, um, had very, very high ICD, ICC uh, reliability. We had uh, training. The five sites were all trained. And what we found is that um, corticosteroids definitely benefit non-ambulatory boys and men. This was the baseline data. And I just want you to focus for a second on force vital capacity and the Brook score. Force vital capacity is, um, uh, is, is important, and if you look and you see the 47 who were on no corticosteroids, they had a force vital capacity of, 50, of 40%, which means that they should be on nocturnal ventilation. Whereas the uh, twice weekly was 57 and 50 for the, for, the, for, the, for the daily, those were all significantly better. But the Brook score, Again, Mike Brook just recently died, but I think it's one of the major contributions to Duchenne in the non-ambulatory world because the Brook scale, which we're all going to do right now, um, go ahead now. So everybody's going to do a Brook score of one, which is your arms can go all the way up next to your head, and you can touch your ears um, with your shoulders. And then that's a Brook score of one. And we all should be able to do that unless you injured your shoulder or something. And then a Brook score of two is here. And a Brook score of three is that you can, uh, um, you can uh, lift a glass to your mouth. And a Brook score of four means you can adjust your glasses or you know, be nervously make sure your hair is looking OK today. But those, or push your glasses up. Little common things. It's your face. That's a Brook score of four. And, um, uh, but you cannot feed yourself. And so if you look at the average Brook score, uh, of course, five means you can run your wheelchair, and six means you can't do that. You can't use a computer. You can't use your... Uh, so the Brook score on the those who were still on steroids 
averaged three, and the Brooks score, um, for those who were not on steroids, was uh, 4.5. So, now I'm gonna talk just two seconds about uh, Deflay score. The reason I put this whole big picture up here is just to remind everybody that the people who did this work did it in 1990. Um, Alan Pestronk was is my boss, was and is my boss, and he was the PI on this study. Uh, I was just starting out, so the work was done in 1990, and um, and then the work was published, as most of us know, just recently. The, the only point here I would make is that the mean age of these guys was 8, 8.5. Again, this is back in the day. That's when you treated them. And they, they had three treatment arms and one brief placebo arm. Again, because even then it was deemed unethical to keep a placebo arm going too long. The placebo arm didn't do well. But the three doses, which you'll see in the next slide, were 0 0.9, uh, one point and 1.2, and the, so the two on the left showed that strength improved, and then prednisone is the one on the right. So all three groups statistically improved and did not differ significantly from each other, but weight absolutely did. Now the two on the left did gain, this is in kilograms, they, they, they did gain weight. Um, uh, so gaining five kilograms or 10 pounds is not normal, but it was certainly a lot better than gaining uh, nine. So the weight gain was statistically better, and that's absolutely true for daily deflazacord versus daily prednisone. I think I have no control, it's random. It's okay. <laughs> so why do they work? I have to bring you back to the mice just for two slides. I was trying to figure that out. Uh, um, and I and a colleague, Dr. Paul Golumbek, um, looked at whether it was, you know, since we knew intermittent steroids worked, and we knew daily steroids in short-term studies also worked in the mouse, we c created a knockout that had no adaptive immune system, no B cells, no T cells. And when we did that, um, and then treated them with oral, twice-weekly steroids, the mice uh, still got weak, even if they had no BOT cells. You might have guessed they would do better. They didn't. But they still responded to steroids. So at that point, we knew it wasn't just inflammation or, or T cell effect or B cell effect. It wasn't just that. And then much more recently and much more beautifully, um, uh, 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 Beth McNally's work, uh, uh, group in Chicago showed that intermittent corticosteroid dosing would enhance repair without eliciting atrophy. So the first experiment is, um, is shown here, and the, the, vehicle, the vehicle is on the left. Oh, sorry, could you go? Back one, thank you. Vehicles on the left, and this is an interesting little experiment where you just poke a hole in, a di in, in the muscle fiber in a dish, and you get this big delta lesion, which has been described for many, many years. If you give them prednisone or deflazacort daily, or um, uh, one dose, sorry, one dose in the dish, this is, uh, you, you get a much smaller delta lesion. Uh, a plerinone does not change the delta lesion. And now the next slide, Thank you. Uh, which is the really important one, is they demonstrated that the repair pathway is fixed, if you will, improved by daily steroids or once weekly. So daily, 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 uh, uh, weekly prednisone, the, the blue, basically I want you to focus on this for one second on just the fact that the blue is about the same. Vehicle treated have a lot of blue, a lot of fibrosis. So the repair pathway is helped by all four dosing regimens in these mice. So weekly, daily prednisone, weekly deflazacort, daily deflazacort. But the obvious difference is that atrophy only developed in the MDX mice that were treated daily. So the physical size of the diaphragm, which is what the top panel is a cross section of, was physically bigger, whether you used weekly prednisone or weekly deflazacord. And they then went on to show that grip strength was also superior in the intermittent treated mice, treadmill was better, and the actual cross section of the fibers was much better in those treated once weekly. 
The interesting fact of what they were treated with is, a, is once a week at, a, at a, the equivalent dose of one milligram per kilo once a week in this mouse study. Um, just shifting gears for one slide, and I hope maybe I can um, come back to this. We know that it starts early. I showed you that on the first slide. So along with trying to figure out how to provide uh, outcomes for the older group, we were also committed, and this is in collaboration with six sites, including New Newcastle, where we use the Bailey to just say, how are the boys doing if we assess them compared to their peers? And the motor score shown on the left is at baseline. They are shifted to the left as we expect. So they're not normal. That p-value compared to normal children is very robust. And then on the right, you see that what happens over time, you know, if you look at each and every 10 is what's supposed to be happening in normal children. So only a single child who was about two or three months at his first visit hit 10. The average was low, but they on average also lost. A few of them bounced around a little bit, but, uh, but on average, they, they lost um, uh, milestones, even at this very early age, which tells us what we all know. We need to find treatments that start early and work. I added this slide um, uh, last night, so because I think it's relevant. I am the only, I, until three years ago, I, there wasn't any data out there other than mine on twice weekly. Um, until 2014, where this group, um, uh, and I didn't know about this work, it showed up, but they wanted to look at twice weekly corticosteroids and heart function. So they used the five per kilo twice weekly, and they looked at left ventricular function before and after three months. So this is baseline compared to their three month. It was a well done study. They actually enrolled 25 people, 20 of whom had either Duchenne or Becker, 17 with Duchenne, three with Becker, and there were five girls in the study who happened to have limb girdle, muscular dystrophy. But the, the left ventricular function improved, and this was a prospective study, it, um, and it was fraction, uh, shortening fraction. This is the relevant piece of the, of the study. In their hands, the CK also dropped, um, but uh, fractional shortening um, improved fairly dramatically. They, that was a pilot study. They stopped. The idea was, could you use intermittent steroids? They had very, very few side effects. It was extremely well tolerated for three months. Um, uh, they had one child who, uh, who didn't tolerate it, but, they, but they, it's a, it's a well-done study, at least uh, from this neurologist's point of view. Uh, so the cardiologist might not think it's so perfect, but it's, a, it's the only other thing in the literature that I know of um, that is using, that has used twice weekly. Okay, let's skip that one. Okay. And, oh, sorry, this is the last slide. So we do, I did complete a study on twice weekly steroids in Bailey. I'm sorry it's in review. I checked this morning. So it's in the final stages of review. Um, but the short answer is that um, uh, on average, it probably does improve the Bailey as an outcome in, in young children. And um, hope that I can talk about that at another time. Next. Slide. My dream slide is that I uh, hope that Duchenne and Becker can be diagnosed by newborn screening, that we will have specific yeah, yeah. mutation-specific yeah. therapy or mutation non-specific therapy, and that we will do early intervention for cognitive um, effects, and that we would increase walking to between 30 and 60, and a lifespan would be normal. And last slide is just my thank you, um, particularly to the children, but all of my collaborators.